Reason number six, castration as a blemish. Part A, animal castration as an injury blemish. Leviticus 24, 19 through 20. And if a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. The Lord laid down a judicial principle for Israel in the above verses. Every crime committed against a person was to be punished by an equal penalty against the criminal. It is not here our concern to explain the present-day application of this particular set of verses. Suffice it to say that inflicting an injury on a fellow human being is clearly sinful. We intend rather to focus in on the word injure, which occurs in both verses. The word in Hebrew is mum, which means blemish. If you examine the various verses in which the word occurs, you will find that the scripture contains listings of different types of blemishes. Here they are, with the English words translating mum being capitalized. Leviticus 21, 17 through 20. Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach the offer bread of his God. For no one who has a defect shall approach a blind man or a lame man or he who has a disfigured face or any deformed limb or a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or a hunchback or a dwarf or one who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scabs or crushed testicles leviticus 22 20 through 22 and 24 through 25 whatever has a defect you shall not offer for it will not be accepted for you and when a man offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a special vow or for a free will offering of the herd or of the flock, it must be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no defect in it. Those that are blind or fractured or maimed or having a running sore eczema or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord, nor make of them an offering by fire on the altar of the Lord. Also, anything with its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord, or do in your land. Nor shall you accept any such from the hand of a foreigner for offering as the food of your God. For their corruption is in them. They have a defect. They shall not be accepted for you. Note that in addition to blindness, crippledness, broken limbs, eczema, and running sores, there also occurs bruised or crushed or torn or cut testicles. God here declares that damaged or destroyed testicles are a bad thing. We think that all would agree that the list in the above verses are bad things. We have never seen anyone declaring the great benefits of being crippled or blind or of having running sores. Once again, though, exceptions are made for birth control. We are told in the news media in sex manuals about the quick and easy, virtual, foolproof method of birth control, vasectomy. Once again, what is a bad thing in scripture is a good thing in our culture. But we Christians should seek to find out what the Bible says, not what the latest point of view is. The Bible says that anyone who gets a vasectomy is injuring themselves, something forbidden by the Bible. As an aside, take a look at Leviticus 22:24. This verse forbids offering defective animals to God, but according to a number of translators and interpreters of the Bible, it forbids the castration of animals as well. We see from numerous Bible passages that God cares about animals. Some view Leviticus 22:24 as a protective law for them. If this is the case, then we would say that if castration is forbidden for animals, it is certainly forbidden for people. But this point is not essential to our position. We throw it in because it is a possible argument against birth control. No matter what one thinks of the argument of the previous paragraph, he or she is still faced with the fact that the scripture calls castration a blemish in animals. If a destroyed or damaged reproductive system is a blemish for animals, how much more so for human beings made in the image of God? Therefore, neither permanent sterility, vasectomies, nor partial sterility condoms are permissible. Castration destroys the seed before it is made. Birth control destroys the seed after. It is only a matter of timing, and both do the same thing, namely, waste seed. Tubal ligation, which is merely female castration, is by implication forbidden also. Part B. Eunuchs in Israel. Deuteronomy 32.1. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall so enter the assembly of the Lord. We see that the scripture points to the badness of castration in Deuteronomy 23.1. If a person was a eunuch involuntarily, 
was not allowed to be a full Israelite, what would God's view be towards someone who did this awful thing to himself because he wanted to prevent God from sending children into the world? Part C. Punishment for potential damage to the male reproductive system. Deuteronomy 25, 11-12 If two men, a man and his countrymen, are struggling together, and the wife of one comes near to deliver her husband from the hand of the one who is striking him, and puts her hand, seizes his genitals, then you shall cut off her hand. You shall show no, not show pity. This law is even more pointed than the previous one on eunuchs, in order that she may stop a man who is fighting with her husband. A lady grabs her husband's opponent by his sexual organs. What does God say to do with her? Do you reward her? Do you commend her for saving her husband? No. Rather, the civil authorities are commanded to take the lady and cut off her hand. They cannot cancel the punishment or change it. The lady gets her hand cut off, whether she hurt the man or not. We can observe that God is angry with such a lady. If there is a fight with the woman and grabs the man's hand or foot, she suffers no punishment. But if she grabs his sexual organs, she gets her hand cut off. God is, by these verses, showing that interfering with the sexual organs job is strictly forbidden. And these verses become a proof text for forbidding birth control because birth control prevents the sexual organs from carrying out their duties. Just the same as grabbing sexual organs in a fight has the potential to do. If God forbids the potential on pain getting the hand cut off, how much more does God forbid the actual? Reason number seven. Seed as semen or children. Hebrews 7, 9 through 10. And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Job 10, 8 through 11. Thy hands fashioned made me altogether. Wouldst thou now destroy me? Remember now that thou hast made me as clay, and wouldst thou turn me to dust again? Didst thou not pour me out like milk, and curl me like cheese, clothe me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews? If a person looks up the word seed in the Old Testament, an interesting fact will pop up. Namely, the hero word Sarah is used of human seed in two different ways. Semen, as in Genesis 38, 9, and Leviticus 15, 18, 32, and children or people after birth in Genesis 46, 6, and Leviticus 22, 13. Some may say, so what does that prove? The word house can be used of man's building or of man's family. Likewise, just because the word for semen and offspring is the same word, this doesn't prove that they are the same thing. To oppose this view, we have reason in Scripture. The reason that Scripture uses the same word for semen and children is because all humans at one time existed in semen form. Without semen, no children are possible. So viewing children as a continuous process, we can see that the word seed applies well to both stages of human life, before and after conception. Further, what is the reason that most methods of birth control seek to prevent seed from uniting with the female egg? Is it not to prevent the birth of real people who may result from the semen produced by the sexual act? Obviously, birth control does not seek to prevent the birth of imaginary babies. Imaginary babies do not need prevented. Next, the scripture in Hebrews 7, 1 through 10, proves the subservience of Levitical priesthood to the prophesied Melchizedek priesthood of Christ by using the following logic. Levi is less than Abraham, and Abraham is less than Melchizedek. Therefore, the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ, prophesied by Psalm 110, is greater than the Levitical priesthood of the Mosaic Covenant. During the argument of Hebrews, there occurs the following statement. And so, to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Note that Hebrews says that Levi, in some real, not imaginary way, was in the loins of his great-grandfather, Abraham. Now, if Abraham had practiced birth control and succeeded, would he not have eliminated the real person, Levi, who was born some hundred years later, according to this verse? Here's what John Owen said when commending upon the scripture, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. The force of this proof seems to depend on double principle. That children, the whole posterity of anyone, are in his loins before they are born. This principle is sure in the light of nature and common reason. They are in them as the effect and its cause. Nor have they any future existence, but with relation unto their progenitors, even the remotest of them. By the way, Owen was opposed to birth control as may be observed from his comments upon Hebrews 13.4. Those who practice birth control should realize that they are doing not 
only eliminates semen, which nobody seems to be concerned with, but thereby also eliminates future people. These eliminated people exist in the loins of those who practice birth control and are subsequently destroyed by birth control. We have encountered people who disagree with the above view because of what the Bible says about predestination. Such persons reason like this, well, God decides who will be born on earth. Therefore, if I practice birth control and God gives me two children, that must be how many children God wants me to have. Therefore, since nothing can hear God's mighty will, birth control is okay. What shall we say to this? Well, we say that if this line of reasoning is correct, then nothing is sin at all. For example, you could shoot your neighbor in the head and say, well, God could have stopped me from pulling the trigger, or he could have made the bullet miss. Therefore, since nothing can hinder God's mighty will, murder is okay. Or perhaps you might set houses on fire and say, well, since everything that happens is according to God's mighty will, then arson must be okay. Who is there among Christians who accept such incredible sophistry when it comes to murder or arson? But many Christians will swallow reasonings like this in order to justify conduct which they already agree with. Like birth control! Of course, God has the ability to give couples, children, whether they practice birth control or not. But this proves nothing at all. According to Holy Scripture, God can make children out of rocks. But if you are waiting for God to make kids for you this way, we think that you'll be waiting a long time. Those who use such reasoning means to justify themselves, need to realize that God has appointed godly means to accomplish godly ends. God wants to give us food, but he has willed that we should work to get it. Likewise, God wants to help us when we are in trouble, but he wants us to pray first. Now, God feeds lots of people who are lazy and helps lots of people who don't pray as they should. But does this justify laziness or people who don't pray? Of course not. Likewise, God sometimes gives people children in spite of condoms, spermicides, withdrawal, and even abortion. This fact does not justify any of these unnatural activities. It's God's command that we have children, and therefore it's God's will that we have natural sexual intercourse to accomplish this goal. Let us now examine God's work concerning Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, Isaiah 37, 21 through 29. Sennacherib had invaded and destroyed Judea, as God himself had ordained long before the event. Yet, does this fact of predestination show that Sennacherib's conduct was morally defensible? Absolutely not. As one may see from reading Isaiah 37, 28 through 29, God was angry with Sennacherib for his ungodly conduct, even though God preordained the event. This is needless to say a mysterious concept, but it should be apparent that the predestination does not justify forbidden conduct. It is not without reason that Moses says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, The secret things belong to the Lord of God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. It's further true that our view of birth control does not contradict the biblical doctrine of predestination. We now quote in the writings of John Calvin, who, as we all know, surely believed in predestination. The voluntary spilling of semen outside of intercourse between man and woman is a monstrous thing. Deliberately to withdraw from coitus in order that semen may fall on the ground is doubly monstrous. With this to extinguish the hope of the race and to kill before he is born the hope for offspring. This impiety is especially condemned now by the spirit through Moses' mouth that Onan, as it were, by violent abortion, no less cruelly than filthily cast upon the ground the offspring of his brother, torn from the maternal womb. Besides, in this way he tried, as far as he was able, to wipe out a part of the human race. If any woman ejects the fetus from her womb by drugs, it is reckoned a crime, incapable of expiation, and deservedly Onan incurred upon himself the same kind of punishment, infecting the earth by his semen. In order that Tamar may not might conceive a future human being as an inhabitant of the earth. Calvin's Latin commentary on Genesis 38.10. Though Calvin certainly believed in predestination, yet he condemned birth control as the murder of future human beings. He certainly did not think that God's secret purposes justify uh, conduct which the word of God forbids. As for our second scripture passage, Job 10.8-11, we have Included it because it is one of the few passages, but not the only one in the Bible, to describe the sexual act itself and relate it to the creation of an individual person. Verses 10 and 11 describe the emission of semen as formation to baby in the mother's womb. What's noteworthy about the verse is this. Job specifically says it was him, Job, present in the semen of his father. Sir, didst thou not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Having read anti-abortion literature published by Christians, We've noticed that a sizable portion of Bible text cited to prove the children in the womb are human beings are passages like this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. Jeremiah 1 5. Yet many who correctly oppose abortion also favor birth control, in spite of Job 10 10, 
which proves that human life is present in human semen. If human life is not human semen, then why do people use spermicides, that is sperm killers? If it is wrong to destroy life in the womb, then it is wrong to deliberately kill semen. Someone might say, Oh, who is there in the church who adopts such a ridiculous, unscientific view of semen? To which we reply, Martin Luther, while commending on Genesis 2.21, he said, Thus is a great miracle that a small seed is planted and it grows out of it a very tall oak, because there are daily occurrences they have become of little importance, like the very process of our procreation. Surely it is most worthy of wonder that woman receives semen, that this semen becomes thick and as Job eloquently said, is congealed and then is given shape and nourished until the fetus is ready for breathing air. Luther's Works, Volume 1, page 126. By the way, Calvin agreed with Luther as one may see by examining his comments upon the same verse. Let us also take the time to point out that the Church of Christ should not get its moral standards from the pseudo-God of modern science, but from the Holy Word of God, the Bible. Bible and real science do not contradict each other at all, where, and where modern scientists draw erroneous conclusions from observations of the natural world, their conclusions are to be rejected. So when great medical authorities declare that baby in the womb is not to be regarded as human being, we must toss their views into the trash, and we must do likewise with their views on birth control.